What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 3. Contemporary Socialism and the Future of America In my last video, I explained socialism in practice and the brutality, suffering, and terror it causes. Giving people a monopoly on everything, including the economy, isn't going to help anyone or make anything better. Giving certain people more power over a society or individual and expecting them to improve the life of an individual is very naive. The person with more power will simply be corrupted and will destroy the life of an individual and thus the entire society for their own personal gain. A state, which is a monopoly on violence, can initiate violence without any legal consequences whatsoever and can successfully destroy the life of many people to achieve the self-interest of the individuals who run the state, something which would never be allowed or go unpunished in a voluntary free market. This contrast to a company or any other business-like entity, such as a co-op, as a company is formed through voluntary contracts and people working to receive what they need and want. The best a company can do to stay alive is to convince people to buy their product. In fact, the only way for a business to run and be incentive for the owner or owners of a business to make a profit it needs to sell enough of its products to consumers. The only way to do this is to make a product at a price which consumers value in large enough numbers for the revenue to exceed the expenses, which are the creation of or purchasing of capital goods, rent, electricity, advertisement, management, wages for the workers, and so on. A free market, since it is based on trade and voluntary exchanges that benefit both sides, is not exploitive or unfair. Socialism can work due to denying human behavior, the rejection of subjective value in market prices, a lack of profits and losses, and the, the state having no incentive to meet the demands of the consumers, and a huge, corruptible bureaucratic class, which simply takes resources from the economy while creating no value on its own. All of these factors, along with the failure of a planned economy and the brutality of, a, of the government, cause the regression of society to any country unfortunate enough to adopt socialism. So then, why do so many young people in the United States sympathize with this deadly ideology? If socialism has failed everywhere it has been tried, killed and ruined the lives of millions, and set back the countries that has been implemented in for decades, why is the support for socialism only increasing? Is it out of ignorance? Is it the way socialism plays with our emotions? I believe it is partially a combination of the two reasons just stated, but the main reason for the increase of support of socialism is down to subversion. Subversion is defined as a systematic attempt to overthrow or undermine a government or political system by persons working secretly from within. Back during the Cold War, the Union, the Soviet Union, or the USSR, used a strategy of subversion to attempt to bring about crisis and demoralization in the USSA and become the dominant world power. According to the former KGB spy, Yuri Bizmianov, there are four stages of ideological subversion. The first stage, demoralization, is to educate people to reject their culture, traditions, and the principles that founded the United States, namely individual freedom and property rights. An entire generation is brainwashed and educated in the socialist and Marxist ideology. The second stage is destabilization. Diminish the old institutions, such as the free market economy, the military, foreign policy, defense systems, and progressively making them more inefficient, ineffective, and unstable, ripe for change and, social and state control. The third stage is crisis. There's a violent change of power, structure, and the economy. The government will now control all of these elements. The fourth and final stage is normalization. The period of stability which could last indefinitely until a new crisis emerges. The KGB used this plan to attempt to subvert the United States by installing Marxists in the, educating, in the education system and having Soviet spies in the US government. Despite the Soviet Union being long gone, the ideology of subversion and control is now rooted in the establishment, namely the deep state, the globalist international organizations such as the United Nations, and their subordinate puppets such as the organizations of Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and various others.
This is done in hopes of totalitarianism, and everyone working for the globalist state will receive the benefits of absolute control, whereas everyone else is a controllable pawn. In every college, public school, and educational institution, there is a Marxist or a socialist professor who teaches about the benefits of the government, social justice, and equality, and the evils of America, capitalism, and quote-unquote institutional racism and white supremacy. This is done to indoctrinate people and to support the ever-increasing state control and authority of politicians and bureaucrats. The modern socialist theory is orthodox Marxism, which is based on the collective and artificial class divide, but expanded to include the quote-unquote oppressed peoples based not just on class alone, but also on race, skin tone, ethnicity, nationality, and other arbitrary collective differences built on the principles of divide and conquer. This theory is called cultural Marxism, and it is destroying Western civilization as I speak. This brainwashing in public school leads to 50% of young Americans having a favorable opinion of socialism, and more than 40% of millennials preferring to live under socialism rather than capitalism. This is a problem, because they are increasingly more likely to vote for government control, which leads to many problems that I will talk about later. After the fall of the Soviet Union, people cheered its collapse in Western nations, but they failed to realize the greater threat. The state, or the government, of Western country practice, very, practice varying degrees of socialism, and state intervention has only increased since the fall of the Soviet Union. A recent example of state intervention in the economy for the worst was when the government put a price cap on insulin, as an example. The, a price cap is simply a government imposing a private a ceiling for how, the, for how high the price of something can be, meaning that if some, something has a price cap of $35, it cannot go above that. The government capped the price of insulin to $35. Price caps don't encourage more efficient means of production. It simply reduces the quantity of that product. Since a price cap enforces a limit on how high prices can be, some companies simply cannot produce a good below that cost because their expenses would exceed their, their revenue. And if they sell that good at the maximum legal price, they would be running a deficit and thus cease production for that good. Some companies can produce a good below the price ceiling, but would produce less due to higher costs, and because they cannot receive the same profit margin they desire for that product. Due to greatly reduced supply, a shortage typically occurs after a price cap is introduced, since the demand exceeds the supplies and the item sells out and is no longer available. Price caps are typically introduced after an event, like a natural disaster or a or when the supply chain breaks. Under a laissez-faire free market, a disaster disrupts production and due to the increase of the demand for goods, prices rise, also called price gouging. The high, sub the high price will be a signal for companies to rapidly produce the good and with the increased profits, companies can have higher expenses to produce more goods than under a normal market. This returns the supply to the pre-disaster levels and thus lowers prices back down to their original levels. However, if a price cap was introduced in that situation, it would only exacerbate the situation. The demand for certain goods increases during a disaster, but sellers can't supply the product to combat this in increase in demand. With price gouging laws, demand would quickly overwhelm supply and it would lead to a shortage of goods. In addition, sellers do not have an incentive to produce more of these necessary goods they get the same amount of money as if it were a normal situation in which demand is much lower. The imbalance between supply, what those sellers can produce, and the demand, the interests of buyers, create shortages, leaving many people without anything during a disaster. Other issues such as extreme inflation, a housing crisis due to rent controls, the shortage of baby formula caused by government shutting down a factory, the boom-bust cycle caused by central banks, and many more issues caused by state intervention and the economy. However, curiously, almost all of these issues are blamed on the free market by socialists, and not the entity that actually created them, the government. These socialists ask for even more government regulation, which only creates more problems. 
Then they blame these problems that the state created on the free market and ask for even more government regulation. And the cycle continues indefinitely. Socialists continue to push for the increase of government intervention because of quote unquote social justice and equality. However, do not be fooled. State intervention and control of anything, especially the economy, will not fix any of the problems. Instead, it will create more. So, what can you, the viewer, take away from my three-part series about socialism? Fight against socialism and government control. Do not let socialism take over in your country. Socialism finally needs to die.